tonight's episode of Board Chitless is sponsored by The Game Steward. The Game Steward is an online game store offering Kickstarter board games out of print and imported games at reasonable prices. It's time to play. Hello and welcome to another episode of Board Chitless, the weekly session report from our game session each week. Um, <laughs> no, never start again. Always one take perfectly. Um, this week I'm joined by Tristan, Jackie and Dave. And we've been playing. Who are you? I'm Lecky. Oh no, <laughs> now we should start again. <laughs> and this week we've been playing 51st State. is a card game for one to four players by Ignacy Trevichek. There you go. That's very um, good. Well, it's a second edition, 51st State. Um, he went away and did Imperial Settlers after the first edition. So it's not the 51st edition. It's the f- second, yeah. It's, and 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 it's better than Imperial Settlers. Ooh. Or is it? We're going to find out in this episode of Board Shitless. Ch- ch- Shitless. <laughs> <laughs> now we'll start again. <laughs> It's a, a second edition if you change the title of the game and mix up the theme and everything, or can you get away with just saying it's, it's a game in its own right, people can buy it and enjoy it? Yeah, it doesn't say second edition on it. I think it's mixed in, it, it comes with some of the, it's called the Master Set, right? It's got some of the expansions that came out for the first edition. So it's post-apocalyptic, Mad Max sort of Fallout style wasteland. Um, it's set in the Norishima universe. Uh, I'm not really familiar with that. I know there's a few games set there, like Norishima Hex, um, but I've never played it, so I can't say much. Um, but there's lots of mutants and something about New York. And uh, <laughs> the theme didn't come through all that well. I, I thought the theme was pretty strong. It's like a race. Mm. It's basically a um, a race to build up a colony in a post-apocalyptic a, a, wasteland. A 51st state, if you will. Exactly. That's what I, you, yeah. I never really knew what 51st State was referring to whenever... England. Oh. In the film, 51st State, with Samuel L. Jackson. Yeah, but this has got nothing to do with that, though, has it? No, this is something completely different. <laughs> has anybody that. read the <laughs> flavour blurb for this game? Uh, no, because... because <laughs> I'll explain, like, obviously I was familiar with Imperial Settlers, so I, didn't, I just skimmed the rule book. To be honest, we could have been playing it wrong, but I did watch uh, Rodney's video on Watch It Played before we played it tonight, so it's pretty clear. But I didn't read any of the, the background stuff. By the way, the rule book is pretty funny. Uh, one of the things that it says in the rule book is we don't give a crap who, who how you decide who the first player is. Just do it, which I think is quite refreshing. Cut to the chase. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of humour in there. It felt a bit like a Czech Games um, sort of rule book, making the reading rules a little bit more of an enjoyable experience. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's good. Nice. It's a nice touch. Yeah, so it's a, it's a card game. Um where you're building up a tableau of buildings to make up your state. Um, and it's not just buildings, there might be characters in there, but they're all classes, locations. And it's basically victory point race. You're trying to get to 25 and that sort of triggers the end game. And then whoever's got the most victory points wins. But but the way that it plays is really clever. Uh, if you played Imperial Settlers, it's very similar. It's, it's all about building up cards in your tableau to combo off each other and keep your round going. I think it's really good. I enjoyed it. Yeah. It's definitely um, definitely one way to build your engine and just try and keep it running, mm. despite who might burn down your pubs or... Yes. Um, children. Or children or <laughs> schools. Um, I felt that the mechanics of the game were pretty straightforward and quite easy to follow once you've got your head around them. But so, the, my only gripe really was the so the card layout um, in relation to the rules and the overall design of the game. It wasn't that easy to follow which tokens should be being placed on which cards at what time. So that was the only thing that really stopped us from learning very quickly. But we even got over that over a couple of rounds. Um, so we, it wasn't long before the game was moving along quite smoothly and we were all kind of up to our different things and strategizing quite well. And I think for because it is kind of a second edition, I think Tristan raised this point. The, the card layout and design should be better. 
Like I didn't say that. Well, <laughs> in in Imperial Settlers, I didn't like say it, it on air. <laughs> if if you look at Fifty First State as as the the game engine one point oh, and then Settlers is like two point oh, and this is three point oh, just for argument's sake, the design on Imperial Settlers was a lot. Oh, well, I don't know if it was better than the original Fifty First State, but it's better than the second edition Fifty First State, which is weird because uh, you y- you can sort of tell at a glance, like for o- open production, for example. One of the things that you can do is you can place your workers on other people's cards in their tableaus to take resources, but not all of their cards allow you to do that. And it's quite difficult on 51st State to see which cards at a glance allow you to do that. Um, Whereas in Imperial Settlers, it's quite easy because it's just this big orange blob at the top of every card that can allow you to do it. Yeah. So the like the tableau that you're building, you have like three zones, don't you? So there's a production area which will give you resources from your cards at the beginning of your turn or beginning of your round. Then there's a feature area, which was more to do with modifying resources and storing them for the later turns, wasn't it? There yeah, didn't seem to be too many of those. Passive abilities, wasn't it? The, yeah. 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 And then the third area is very much for actions, so mm. like things that will let you change um, your human resource or um, material resources into victory points. The game seemed quite well balanced for spreading those around quite evenly. Uh, between the players i don't know if anyone else was just drawing rubbish for a while yeah um like i was saying just before we started recording my gripe with it because i i really like imperial settlers it's one of my favorite games so i was really looking forward to playing this and because there's only one deck that everybody draws from that it feels like it all of the really good cards that let you get the really good resources for yourself Obviously, they're obvious what they are, so they get taken away quite quickly. So you're left with rotating the not-so-good cards and getting rid of those and and constantly having them in your hand. And there's not an easy way to get rid of cards out of your hand either. So you're just looking for resources to get cards out of your hands to put them down or to raise them. Uh, And even that's difficult because you need certain resources to raise cards. So you just... I just like I was really stuck at the end with the same cards and no way to to get rid of them so I could build what I really wanted to build which I couldn't get the resources for because everyone already took the really good cards which I really wanted and um the open productions were taken quite quickly as well uh so I kind of I was I started off well and then I just stalled and after that I just couldn't catch up I think there's probably a point in the game where everyone was really struggling to get the resources that they required. Um, I don't know if it was... I think Tristan was struggling quite early on in the game and then kind of go over that a bit later on. Uh, For me, unfortunately, it was two-thirds of the way through the game when my people-making machine was just burnt to the ground. Um, But like Jackie's saying, sometimes there just didn't seem to be enough available out on the table to even start to make deals with people and trade with people. So... So there's certain production cards that are open production, which means that you can put your meeple onto it and then get a small resource back and then the other player gets an extra meeple um, as a reward for that. But e- there didn't even seem to be that much of that going around or even like useful ones, really. It's also like comparing with Imperial Settlers again. On Imperial Settlers, on your like player card, you can. it's pretty obvious what you're supposed to be doing. So the Egyptians, they like gold it says on the card, you know, that's what they generate. So obviously that's what you're going to focus on. Same with uh, the barbarians. It's all about population, using people to to raise and, and things like that. With Fish First Day, it was difficult to sort of try and figure out exactly what your plan was. Like, Tristan, you didn't really sort of... Have a plan. <laughs> yeah, you you had the, the Appalachians or whatever they're called, and they build bricks right from the start, yeah. which is a really hard resource to get. But it was like, it wasn't a clear set really what you were supposed to do with the bricks. And you kind of struggled for a while until, I think until nearly the end yeah. when, it, when it clicked. And then it was like, oh, right. Yeah, this is what I'm supposed to do. And I was the same. I was like looking at my people, they, they get fuel at the beginning. So instantly I'm thinking, oh, fuel is important for me. And then when I started using the fuel, I was like, well, what am I supposed to be doing with it? It was obviously to make deals. I was making deals. Then I couldn't get the fuel. Then I was using fuel for other things. And I was like, right, well, I've completely messed up my plan now. It's just completely out the window. And I think that is an issue as well. I wasn't quite clear with what I was meant to do. It's one of those things where it might come down to preference where 
with like a game like Race for the Galaxy, there's loads of different resources available all the time, and it's very much point salad. Um, and the only real head scratching that's going on is how do you quickly make resources work for you or discard them and pick up new ones. With Fifth of Estate, it felt very much like it was almost like a, a living puzzle. Like you would need certain resources at certain times and they might be there one turn, but the next round they'd be taken away from you for various different reasons. And you're constantly having to adapt and try and make that work for you in the best way that you can. But it almost puts you behind by a round or two because you it's, by the time you've worked out how to take advantage of it, it's moved on again. And it does get very frustrating. Um, but then I would imagine there'd be a certain audience that would actually relish that because maybe they just they prefer that the puzzle behind it, maybe. Well, yeah, because, you know, going off that, it is supposed to be like post-apocalyptic. So resources are scarce anyway, thematically. But again, it was just it just felt like it was too difficult to get certain resources like I, w- I was wanting to raise some of Dave's stuff because he was getting far too far ahead <laughs> but I was I was when I when I took a toilet break I was actually talking to myself in the toilet I, I didn't tell you this at the time <laughs> I was going right well how do I get red things if I need guns and, and I've got to spend them to get red things how do I get more red things is, is the card somewhere that get red things I was like talking to myself thinking how does this work? And it was just like it was sending me a bit mad. Obviously. Yeah, that that is like the main, one of the one of one of the because it's not a straight copy of Imperial Settlers at all. But um, one of the main sort of differences is in Imperial Settlers you've got like wood and stone and gold, and you just chuck these resources at cards, and that's how you buy the cards. In in Fifty First State, you use guns to arm like gangs, I guess, and you gain momentum with you you with your red momentum. Those are crap, by the way. The the <laughs> momentum cut the momentum tokens is no theme there at all. Like we get it. The like, arrows. Yeah. 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 So you can use iron to build grey arrows, which is like you your labor, your manual labor force, I suppose. And you can use fuel to to build blue arrows, which I suppose is like you put your diplomats Cars in a car. Or something, because something, the diplomats then go out and make deals. Or, or you swap it. Yeah. You could have just done some of bit more thematic with that but but the mechanic behind it you you sort of you're using the resources to then take an extra step which so you so you convert in uh guns into armed men and then you're using the armed men to do a thing and there's only so many armed men you can sort of arm per turn so it's like an extra step whereas in imperial settlers it's really easy to sort of see well i need this much wood and this much stone i'm going to use that okay that's done do you get me? It's like it's almost it's almost I want to say overcomplicated, but I think it works really well. I think I think it added something that's not there in Imperial Settlers. I think I definitely experienced the lockout that you guys were talking about, where you you get to the point where um, like you want to do a specific thing, like use you can use the cards, you can turn them upside down to make a deal, which gives you an ongoing resource every turn, which is a cool thing to have, especially early. You increase your production loads. And um, I did it once and then was locked out from being able to do that for like the major portion of the rest of the game. Um, but one of the things I do really like about it the, the is I love games where cards have tons of different uses. And in this, they really do. And it's really, it's quite difficult to get over the sort of an intuitive nature of how you use them. But every card can be played to build the thing that it is, or it can be raised and destroyed by you or it can be raised and destroyed by another player, or it can be turned into an ongoing resource by making it into a deal. Uh, so there's there's like lots of things you can do with it, and then each of them has their own specific thing, like you can do an action on it, or you can do you can produce resources on it, or somebody else can use it to produce resources and give you an extra action. So I really love the var- variation and variety that that brings to uh, the gameplay, and I love games where a card, a single card is significant and, and quite powerful, and they are in this. Um, but as Jackie mentioned before, the the really good ones are really few and far between. So when Lecky had that amazing card that was like, you, you'd just spawn extra workers on it, and then you got the other one which gave you extra cards. Room, yeah, yeah, the, yeah, these are the two probably the two best cards in the game. And yeah. it took me a while to figure out that Dave was spamming them every turn, and then I was like, oh right, yeah, no, card draw and extra actions card draw is, is really important, hugely yeah. significant, especially early game. Yeah, so as soon as I started tapping that, <laughs> like things started to pick up. But then, of course, it became 
a race between yeah. us being able to use it. So then we obviously burnt Lecky's stuff to the ground mm-hmm. <laughs> and then it was gone. And all of those extra delicious actions and uh, cards were out of play. So for for a first game, I actually really enjoyed it. And I think I probably enjoy it more the second time around once, you know, now that sort of passed the minutiae of like all the different ways you can use the cards and everything. Um, but yeah, I think there's a, a really steep sort of barrier to entry in, in processing that. And I think you, you're you right about the iconography. Like it, it's tricky to look across the table and see what of, what of theirs can I use and what of theirs are they using that's really good, that's given them so many benefits that I need to d- destroy it, you know? Uh, and then if I wanted to, can I, you know, can I actually get the resources or the, the, the guns and then the red tokens and whatever else it is I need to to burn it yeah. so th- th- I think there's a bit of a thematic disconnect there's a bit of lockout from the actions which is perhaps more extreme than most other like worker t- worker placement type games that we've played um, but underneath it I think there's a really good sort of satisfying points building and card building engine and I think it, it is important to just point out we only played with the very base set like in, in the box is three expansions well yeah. there's two expansions and we've got the scavengers one as well Um and you add those in one at a time, and I don't. I've not really looked through them, so I don't know how much each changes the game. But I imagine it's fairly like the scavengers one comes with like whole new rules that you only use with scavengers, where you're digging through each other's discard piles. Yeah. Like, uh, so I imagine it changes it quite a bit. Imperial settlers, on the other hand, has got a built-in sort of variation because every faction in that game is completely asymmetrical. Like the way every faction works is different. In this one kind of all the same like they, they have slightly different values on how many guns they can get per turn or fuel or whatever but it doesn't everything that they've got there can be offset with just getting different production buildings you can just get uh like uh, more fuel if you lack fuel whereas yeah. in imperial settlers you've got an entire deck of cards that will say you're egypt they've got like pyramids and and stuff like that and they all sort of combo in different ways and it's like learning a new game every time you pick up a new faction in that whereas this one because of that, it's got to be more finely balanced. Like, I'm, I don't know how balanced Imperial Settlers is, but it can't possibly be as balanced as this because you're all sort of yeah. using the same deck all the time. Well, it says a lot for the game, really, where we started we started off, and because of the way that my faction was set up, I was after cogs. I was like, all I wanted was cogs and um, grey momentum tokens to keep building. And then about midway through the game, for some reason, it was a stockpiling guns. And then at the end of the game, it was fuel. And for me to change my strategy so much, um, so quickly in the game, uh, so many times, that felt like a real achievement because normally in these sorts of games, you'd keep spamming similar things and then occasionally looking out for a few extra bits that I might be able to you know, help you out a bit more. Whereas this one, like I said, it, it really feels like you're trying to tank, you're, you're sort of trying to work out what the Rubik's Cubes are doing, really. The table's not going to always look this you know exactly the same for the entire game there's a lot that actually does change yeah well i i think um when you played the game once the ba- like the base game i think that's pretty much the only time you're going to be able to play it because it, the like the the groups are so similar the cards it's just one deck and it's not a very large deck mm. and it's pretty obvious playing it now that the things you need are people which you need a lot of. Sorry, I won the game and didn't have any extra people, so... Yeah, but you used tons of Lecky's extra people. And I didn't. I, I and used, you had a camp with extra people in it at the end. I used Lecky's extra cards. I used his card draw, and then I burned his you, pub to the ground. You used, my open, more cards. you used my open production for people, which yeah. we won't go into the ethics of that too deeply. <laughs> but then you did have about four or five open production cards in your own tableau. Yeah. Um, so people yeah, were constantly... True giving you workers. Yeah, but nobody was really using them, them early on. Like, I was a bit a bit annoyed, really. I think... No one was using them. I think because um, early on in the game, not a lot of, mm. of the production cards really require... And it's I the think because we weren't people. sure what we were kind of doing. Well, yeah. I was, because uh, I've played a lot of Imperial Settlers, but I think you guys weren't too sure about open production, especially early on. Mm. I mm. don't think it's just that, though. It's a lot of the, um, the action cards require workers. But we weren't really placing our two minute action cards until about yeah. three or four I didn't rounds. Have any for the first few rounds, yeah, you're right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, um, but then when you need them, boy, <laughs> you really need them. Um, mm. And I think that most of them did come out onto the table roughly at the same time. Yeah, you need card draw as well. So the best way to get it is to use people to get card draw. Well, the best way to get it is to get a 
building that gives you card draw. Like, yeah, but that, that's the point where it's like it's only one card, I think, that does that, and then only one person can use it. So that card is quite restricted depending on whose turn it is first, mm -hmm. if you get the chance to get that one. But then again, if you're first, you might have a really cracking like move you want to do straight off, and then that's you locked out mm -hmm. of, of using that card because yeah. somebody else has popped on it like straight off. And, but the game is set up as well. I, I think this is going to be one of the games where we could literally like analyze it for days because there's a really neat mechanic with some of the cards where um, it's almost like a free buff card isn't it so you'll get two red momentum or two blue momentum cards but there's only two of those cards in the game per round so the p first two turns that anyone's going to make usually are steal those cards to get the buff which means that the really good open production cards that are on the table are left open for the people who go third and fourth in that round. Yeah. yeah, so it, it feels like each round, it's even though you're not the first player, it's still there's still that little tweak in the game that will mean that you still get a decent look at the table. It's worker placement, isn't it? Like yeah. in a card game, like Tristan said, it is like yeah, worker yeah, placement a, in a card game. Tab, it, tableau. There is always something you can... There's never like... You never look at it and think, well, there's nothing I can do there. Like, yeah. there's always like, oh, that, well, that's going to help me, actually. Like, and I don't know if anyone ever thought, um, apart from building really low in, um, really low resource cards early on in the game, I don't know if anyone ever made a choice of what resources they're going to spend for an action and thought, wow, this is a great deal. Like, everything <laughs> like everything just felt, felt so expensive, and it really did feel like you were parting with, like, your last bits of cash. Because it's the momentum. Nothing gives yeah. you momentum. Like, the only things that give you momentum is a couple of production buildings and your own special actions. You can have as many resources. Like, in the first couple of turns, I was swimming in resources, but I couldn't store any of them. Yeah. Like, and because that's not what you use to do things. All you're using resources for, really, is to... Gain victory points sort of towards the end of the game, but mainly to gain momentum. Yeah, well, well, this is my point. Like, uh, you once you played the game once, it's kind of obvious what you need to win. So you're gonna need momentum as much as you can. You're gonna need those really good cards that you know, which ends up being like Monopoly. It's like just get Mayfair, you know, because then everyone's yeah. gonna win. Once you've got those things, it's like it's a no brainer. It's like right, I need people, I need card draw, I need those really good cards, I need production, and it's like. You know, you're just going to end up playing the same game again because there's not much difference. But if each player knows that, it's going to provide a challenging sort of balanced play. But even then, like, there are different ways to, to victory. Like, there, there are sort of different strategies. Like, you, you're going to be going for different sets of cards. Like, I was going for guns. A lot of the cards I was playing were comboing off guns because I was a mutant and they like guns. So I was sort of playing, like, riffing on that and I was going for the gun stuff. So yeah, it almost like that last turn was almost a Dominion esque twenty yeah. five minute long min max. Mm. Turn the resources into momentum to cards to victory points to winning. Yeah, yeah, yeah but that's why. Like again, I like Imperial Settlers more because you got your own personal deck and you might draw something out of there that no one no one sees it until you play it. So you might draw it and think that's a really good card. No one knows I've got it. I'm gonna. Bam! Stick that on the table. I'm like, going to do this move, and but with with fifty first day, it's all rotated back into the deck. Mm. Apart from the ones who people keep the really good ones, like I said. So it's just like, oh, I'm getting these same old cards again. The ones that I can't really do anything with at the moment. Whereas, like with Imperial Settlers, you could get a really good card off your own deck that no one else has, and gives you unique things just for you. Mm. So that's why I prefer still. I feel like Imperial Settlers is more of a sandbox for playing in. I feel like when I play Imperial Settlers, if I pick up a faction, especially when I've picked up a faction that I've not played before, like I, I, I can't wait to play the Aztecs and the Atlanteans. I've never played them. And I, and I just like to play, just like play with them <laughs> to see what they can do and just see what combos are coming up in the deck. And like, I don't, I, I feel like it's, I enjoy it as a game. And I do find it, I do find it challenging because it, these aren't like, like the mechanics is quite simple. Both of these games, the amount of decisions that you you're making from turn to turn, it's quite high for a game. It's like a heavy brain burning sort of game because you, yeah. you you know you're trying to figure out the the optimum order as well as you know what to play and and it, it can get quite taxing. But with Imperial Settlers, I find it more I don't want to say fun because I did find Fifty First State fun, 
but more of a sort of a playground, like just seeing there's so much in there that has been put in there to sort of make each faction different. Whereas with this one, it see because it seems more balanced as well because you are destroying from the same deck. This is more of a sort of competitive game, and there was more player interaction in this. Like occasionally, in Imperial Settlers, I'll raise someone, but it's not really much point in Imperial Settlers. You're better off raising your own cards uh, for the most part, I think. Uh, but in this one, you are competing more for for resources, for cards because of the the drafting. You've not got your own deck in this one. In, in Imperial Settlers, you're drafting from a common deck anyway, but you've got your own deck, which is where your good stuff is. Um, and you're also competing for worker placement spaces. There's more open production in this one. So it, it just seems more competitive and and, it, and it's prob- possibly faster. I feel like we should just play Imperial Set- Settlers now. <laughs> like, uh, half of the discussion of this game has been how it relates to Imperial Settlers. And I know, I, think I know. Thematically, I think I probably prefer uh, Imperial Settlers, like yeah. and the art. I know it's cartoony and stuff, but um, I think it just feels more coherent. Whereas this, I, I think the art's pretty cool actually in Fifty First State, but it's a bit, a little bit inconsistent throughout. But um, it, it gives you the vibe. But it, there's something about post-apocalyptic settings that are just a little bit depressing. <laughs> Whereas with Imperial Settlers, you've got like these lovely cartoon characters, and you're building very marching green. off to death. <laughs> <laughs> but you're building all these like lovely green villages and, mm. and towns and things. And um, yeah, we should probably do that next time. I think the layout's better as well. Like we've said that anyway. The Imperial Settlers. I think the cards are cleaner. There's a cleaner look to them and everything. Yeah, yeah definitely, definitely a lot more cutesy, aren't they? Mm, it's yeah. like playing on the old yeah. old school. Early nineties video games. It feels a lot more approachable. Like Age of Empires or, or Settlers. Age of Empires. Or Settlers. Game Remember Settlers? Earlier. Yes. Yeah. On the Amiga. No. Oh. Yeah, and also the Imperial Settlers. It's easy just to look across the table and see what people have got. I think we mentioned with the card design. It's just like, oh, I can use that. On the other hand, like if you're playing the Romans and I'm the Barbarians and you've never played it before, or we've never played with the, you, and you look across the table and see my Barbarians, you won't have a clue what any of them do. Mm. So at least in this one, you sort of you, you are aware. But then the, the the new stuff, like the the other expansions, might add so much. Who knows? But yeah, we yeah. Play yeah. Settlers. It's great. I'd, I'd happily play. I play either. <laughs> happily yeah. play either of them. I'd I'd happily play over Imperial Settlers or Fifty First State again. Mm. Um, they were both. I I remember playing Imperial Settlers at um Games Expo and having a lot of fun with playing that. And again, I really enjoy playing Fifty First State. It's I can't remember enough about Imperial Settlers, unfortunately, to really be able to say specifically which one that was bestest. That would have bestest. been the beer. That would have probably been the beer or the talking all day. But um, yeah, they're both great games in my opinion. Yeah, um, really liked it. It was me that picked it up because I liked Imperial Settlers so much. Saw it at the expo. I think it was actually being sold from the actual developer's stand, I think, or the publisher's stand. Uh, so I just picked it up. And um, I enjoyed it. I did enjoy it, but I just think Imperial Settlers for me has the edge. Definitely. Great stuff. So we'll be back next week with uh, more games and more reports. So join us then. Bye. 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 Bye.